Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shiv. Um, it's great to welcome you all to the fifth talk of our eight part uh, national research series in collaboration with OR UK and BOTA. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Shiv and I'm the current president of the British Orthopaedic Medical Students Association. It's great to have you all here this evening. So this webinar is gonna be on collaborative research and we're uh, blessed to have uh, Mr. Kenneth Rankin who is a consultant orthopaedic surgeon uh, with an interest in orthopaedic oncology in the northeast of England. Um, he's based at the Newcastle University Centre for Cancer um, and works at the RVI and Freeman Hospitals and is also the chief investigator for a large NIHR funded uh, clinical trial in sarcoma surgery called Sarcosite. Um, and he'll be delivering the first part of this talk on collaborative research. Just a bit of housekeeping before we uh, move on to the talk. Uh, we're more than welcome, we're more than happy to have questions, um, but if you could all remain muted for the duration of the talks and just use the chat box for your questions, that would be great. And then uh, Nadir, my colleague, will uh, feed all of them back to uh, Mr. Rankin at the end of this talk. Okay, so without much further ado, I could I hand over to you, Mr. Rankin? Yes, uh, thank you, Shiv. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the int introduction. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to give this talk on collaborative research. Um, my housekeeping is I've got small children around, so apologies if they're a bit noisy at times. Um, so um, I've done actually a, quite a lot of collaborative research. And in fact, if you told me, say, 10 years ago, um, all the different um, people I would have collaborated with, uh, I would have been quite amazed. Um, and I think it really boils down to just being open-minded um, and sort of trying to interact as widely as possible um, and just being interested because you, you, you never quite know where this research can take you. Um, and uh, if you interact well, um, and, and of course, if you're enjoying it, then, um, it can become very interesting uh, and it has allowed me to really forge um, uh, a good career as a, a clinician scientist. Yeah, so just a bit of background. So um, before I entered higher specialist training in orthopedics, I was a clinical research fellow at, in, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead. Uh, and then I got some funding um, uh, from the Royal College of Surgeons of England um, to really concentrate on research in the lab for, for a further year. So I did an MD thesis uh, inspired by my colleague Craig Durand there, uh, who kept telling me, you know, if, if I did some lab research, something good might happen. And then my old late friend, um, Andy Sprousen, uh, he, he had been in the lab and he um was enjoying himself and suggested to me that it would be interesting and that's really what started off um my first collaboration so i had i had supervision from a clinician but also from a scientist who had uh, expertise in, in um, bone biology uh and i've never really left the lab since and did spend some time in dundee uh as a locum orthopedic registrar but came back to the northeast uh, uh, as an academic clinical lecturer. So basically during my orthopedic high specialist training as a registrar, uh, I, I had an academic number as we call it. Uh, and, it and it was really important actually that because it allowed me time back in the lab. So, um, and I shifted focus to osteosarcoma. My MD had been on breast cancer bone metastases. But essentially the key point was that it just gave me that time again as a clinician to interact with scientists uh, and this is actually an MRI scan of my knee. I had a, a knee injury and that just allowed me a bit more time because I had to be off clinical duties for a while. So I read the literature in a bit more detail. And the reason I show this all the time is that I became interested in a matrix metalloproteinase, basically in the context of, of um, bone sarcoma and osteosarcoma in particular. And that has gone a really long way. And that, you know, that was back in um, 2010 uh, my knee injury and it's holding up all the way till now and that's again I'll show you all the way through the talk um, amongst other things I've been doing with, in terms of collaborations how, how it's worked out and essentially I show this cartoon uh, really just from the point of view of what I was thinking back in those days as I say a lot of it's held up 
And the thinking was in the concept of osteocle where you've got osteoblasts making bone uh, at the growth plate. And that's why osteosarcomas arise uh, in children, teenagers and young adults mainly. But if they have an oncogenic event, you have an osteosarcoma cell, which is overexpressing MT1 MMP, degrading type one collagen and bone can activate other MMPs, which allows the cell to metastasize. Um, so to test some of these theories, I eventually at the end of my academic, sort of I had a year block in the lab, I got a, a basic grant to, to study it in more detail and I was able to appoint uh, a postdoc to work on it. And so that sort of really started off my life as a clinician scientist and I didn't look back from that point. And there's obviously a bit of a gap from MD to, to really the NIHR academic clinical lecturer post and being able to be a clinician scientist, which is, has continued ever since. And so obviously that's about combining clinical and research work. And you've really got to enjoy both disciplines and hand in hand with enjoying your research, you've got to be able to collaborate effectively and try and see where your research can align uh, with uh, other researchers from whatever uh, academic discipline they may come from. Uh, so you find some common features. And um, as an academic, you've really just got to be persistent. And some of you may have already experienced rejection of grants or, and or papers. And also you get a bit of suspicion on both sides, particularly if you're doing some lab work, the scientists are a bit suspicious of a, um, a clinician in the lab. And also the other way around in the hospital, some of your colleagues may be a bit suspicious of all this academic work you're trying to do, but it's really important. And uh, as I'll show you, um, you can certainly pull it, pull it off. And this was just a bit contrived, but I like to look at the common features. So this is me with Kate, my first postdoc, and designing experiments with her. It was a bit like the new patient clinic. You're all excited. You're going to do some research work and it's going to be wonderful and change everything. Uh, and that's a bit like meeting a patient in the clinic where you're going to do some amazing operation and, and they're going to get a great result. And some of the lab work is a bit similar to what you do when you're executing your ideas. Cell culture in the lab, you have a sterile environment so that you obviously you don't want infections. It's similar to the operating room and you, you execute your uh, techniques. And the downstream experiments are a little bit like war drowns where you're seeing the patient shortly after and hopefully everything is, is going smoothly, but obviously not always. Uh, and then I think on the clinical side, usually, fortunately, in orthopedics, which is probably why you're mainly you, one of the reasons you may be interested in it, is usually in the follow-up clinic, everything's gone really well and um, the patient's happy. And, uh, and that's where you get the satisfaction on, on the clinical side. And the research side, you may be aware, it's often not like that. And um, often your experiments don't work, but um, with persistence, you can get somewhere. And so again, this is this MT1 MMP um, marker that I've been interested in all this time. And it was just about building evidence that it was relevant. So I was doing things like Western blots to look at protein expression in sarcoma cells and breast cancer cells and prostate cancer cells and finding it was there in some of the cells and not in others. And then looking at tissues available to us in the pathology lab and showing that the intense brown staining on the left is showing the expressions high in an osteosarcoma compared to osteoid osteoma, which is a benign bone tumor, and it's got low expression. So I just started building data. Uh, and um, some people you will collaborate with, and it's really, really important not to forget, is that you should be collaborating with your patients. And you'll find patients will often really be interested in what you're up to. And actually, this is a this x-ray is an x-ray of a mouse with an osteosarcoma in the femur. And the tissue actually came from a young chap who had an osteosarcoma in his fibula. But when he was having a biopsy, he was very keen when I came along to consent him to take the some of the biopsy tissue and put it in a mouse. And so we were able to actually have a patient derived xenograft off of his tissue. And we looked at my favorite marker, mt one mp and it's expressed there. So this was really quite compelling. And the patient was very excited by all this. Uh, and um, he sadly had to undergo an amputation, but he did the Great North run, uh, but did develop 
the lung, lung mets and pass away, but he was uh, an interaction. I had a collaboration actually with a patient that really was life changing for me. And ever since uh, I've um, done more and more work with, with patients because it's really important. That's at the end of the day, uh, what we're trying to do with our research is improve um, what happens to our patients. Um, just some other examples then that uh, took off. Um, uh, Lysander here on the left was a, an intercalating medical student back in 2017, uh, obviously at Newcastle. But I said to him, look, why don't you go and look at our favorite marker, mt one mmp uh, along with a, a colleague of mine down there, Prof. Matthew Allen, who's a veterinary surgeon, a, a veterinary orthopedic surgeon, really, and he does a lot of uh, procedures on dogs. Uh, and dogs get a lot of osteosarcoma, right? So uh, Lysander spent half his time in Newcastle, then he went down to Cambridge, and he was able to show that actually it, it held up. And in fact, mt one mmp was predictive of outcome. So high staining in the dog osteosarcoma tissue was predicting um, outcome as in poorer survival for those dogs. So that was a really interesting interaction, a collaboration that Lysander won the, um, the project prize for, for that year. And so over the years, I've kept going, getting various grants, um, some really interesting projects, circulating tumor cell detection. Then this other project at the bottom opportunity came along. So Cancer Research UK uh, in 2015, 2016, set up these multidisciplinary project awards. And it's a good example of how we get funding now is that it's, in, it's increasingly recognized, it's really promoted more and more and more in the academic world that by collaborating uh, and putting together multidisciplinary projects, um, we will get outcomes that we would not have got before because clinicians and scientists, or it could be any physiotherapists, uh, uh, bioinformaticians, look at data and, and, and set up projects in quite different ways. And if you put them together, they will often do something that's not possible when they sit in their own uh, sort of research niche. And so this is a great example of it. So my colleague, Daniel Frankel in the middle there, who we, I knew from the lab again, uh, where I'd done my MD, he said to me, you know what, why don't we, I, I know this guy in Cambridge, he's got a naked mole rat colony. Why don't we put, get it, put it together uh, as an application um, in terms of uh, the multidisciplinary cancer research UK um, uh, funding stream. Uh, and I was saying, well, well, what do you want to do that for? And he said, well, they're cancer resistant and you're, you're interested in cancer. Why don't we put it together like that? I bet you would, we're probably would be the only application where you've got an orthopedic surgeon, um, a bioengineer and a, a, a reader in nociception from the Department of Pharmacology at Cambridge that can put it together like that and study it in that in that much detail. So you and uh, St. John Smith on the on the right there, he, he um, studies naked mole rats because they've got interesting different pain pathways, but they're also cancer resistant. Uh, and that's why we put it together and we got the grant, right? And this this came through to much astonishment at the university. They really couldn't believe that an orthopedic surgeon was involved as a co-principal investigator on a pretty uh, healthy uh, funded award. And it was really what we did in this project and that's been published was looking at material properties of naked mole, mole rat hyaluronin, which has a heavy molecular weight. And we may be able to harness some of those properties to prevent tumor recurrence. So we still, we still have, have some outputs coming off that grant, um, but a really interesting experience to, to collaborate in that way. Here's another example, right? And uh, Again, um, back in, so this was about 2017, 2018, a therapeutics company turned up from, again, Cambridge, and they happened to have developed a therapeutic targeted to MT1 MMP. Uh, and this essentially is a bicyclic peptide that binds to, the, to this enzyme in the cell surface and causes cell death. It, it carries a cytotoxin as well to cause cell death. And so when their trial opened up, um, because I'd done so much work with a pathology lab here in, in Newcastle, uh, I was able to um, put my own patients on the trial because I was able to stain them for the, for, um, for the, to, to prove they had high expression and get them on the trial. So this is a patient with a chondrosarcoma that had lung mets. Um, so that's just an example of, again, mainly collaborating with the pathology lab actually to work up the, 
the, the methodology for, for staining the tissue. Uh, another example uh, in the therapeutic world, working with a scientist, uh, Anja, who's um, originally from Germany and was at Newcastle, has now moved up onto the Netherlands. Um, we were talking about doing more of this therapeutic work and she had a colleague in the University of Stuttgart, Roland Konterman, uh, she said, well, we'll be able to get a therapeutic from him and we can try it in your mouse model of, of bone sarcoma. So we had one of our orthopedic trainees um, who was working in the area, develop the model further where we can track tumor formation. We can do the histology. And again, the histology goes through the um, pathology lab. And this was actually an orthopedic research UK funded project. Uh, and we were able to do a really elegant study showing that we had a, a model of, of the, the bone sarcoma in the mouse. But then when Roland Konterman sent us his therapeutic, we were able to test it effectively. And here we're looking at a different cell surface uh, target called death receptor five. Uh, and what we wanted to do was, um, this is overexpressed in our model. So we want to kill the cells by giving them trail, which is a protein that binds to death receptor five. Now the problem with it, trail by itself is it'll often not bind very well and come off. Um, so what uh, Roland Conteman's group are able to do is combine trail with an SVC fragment, which means it's, it's a, a fragment of antibody to recognize another cell surface target. And this was astonishingly effective uh, and we've got really excellent results. Oh, apologies, I'm just, <laughs> got somebody on the door. Apologies, I'm looking after kids myself, right? So, um, yeah, so basically, this is showing that therapeutic when we put it on cell lines in vitro, so just in, in the dish. So, that targeted trail, this red line means that at a tiny, tiny, tiny dose of it, we're killing the cells very effectively um, compared to the trail by itself. Uh, and when we, uh, when Zach knocked out the target with CRISPR, then that rescued cells because of course the trail didn't have anything to bind to, so it protected them. Uh, and then when we went on to do a, 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 a clinical trial in the mice, then the untreated mice, the tumors, uh, so that's the control there, the, the tumors continue to grow. Uh, mice treated with doxorubicin, which is an old chem chemotherapeutic agent and doesn't really work. And it's the same in our patients. Tumors continue to grow, but we were able to con control the tumors in any mice that were receiving both the targeted trail, and even the non-targeted trail. So it's really quite impressive results. Um, so we're working on publishing that. So that's just to show you again, collaboration. And th in this case, it was with a, you know, um, a scientist who could then contact somebody else to get a, a therapeutic allowed us to do something that was quite compelling. Uh, what we've done more recently, and Shiv mentioned that um, the chief investigator for this uh, fluorescence guided surgery trial that's just setting up when we're due to start recruitment in the summer, is that um, on the clinical side, again, removing these um, tumors, uh, we're often worried that we're too close to the tumor. So we started using a fluorescent dye that was available to us from the pharmacy, making tumors for us. Uh, and very rapidly, it became obvious this, this would probably be useful to use in a trial. And then I'll show you, again, this is through collaboration. So this is now then collaborating with uh, trials teams that will allow you to work up and design a, uh, a, an application and uh, hopefully get it uh, funded. So this dye that I've mentioned has been used for many years. It's usually used to assess tissue perfusion, but we worked out that if you give the dye the day before surgery intravenously to the patient and use an infrared camera uh, during the operation, then uh, it might be uh, effective. And so there's the first case it worked on, uh, this is already four years ago, there's this, this big tumor in the pelvis. 
And actually, when we were operating, I started to realize it probably was working. And once we completed the operation, you can see they've cut into the tumor and it's fluorescing. The next case was a soft tissue sarcoma on the forearm, really nasty thing. That's before we started the operation with a normal light on the, on the camera. You can see it's ulcerated, but then infrared mode, it's fluorescing. So there's different modes. There's a green mode, a black and white mode. But it actually, it's quite useful in the flexor compartment where I was worried that I was next to tumor. I was able to look at that on the fluorescence mode, and it clearly was tumor. I was able to revise the margin by ligating the, the radial artery and therefore get a, a, a better margin. And in fact, a clear margin in this case, you can see there's no background fluorescence in that area. Uh, and that's, that's another mode that uh, comes up. It's a sort of uh, color segmented mode. So, um, so later in the year, I met with a research design service and a cancer trials team and started building this trial application. Obviously, this was pre-pandemic, so we met face-to-face. -face, and I haven't actually seen any of them face-to-face -face since because it's all been virtual, which is a bit of a shame. But um, one of the first things to do was get our cases um, written up, and, uh, and that was the world's first uh, report of fluorescence guided surgery for tumor margin identification sarcoma. And then... So apart from collaborating with patients and trials teams, then you need to collaborate with your young academic colleagues and Marcus Brooks, who likes his data, had been an MRS student with me. He did a lot of background data work just to show that if you've got a positive margin following a, a tumor resection, then um, it correlates with local recurrence as you'd expect if you've left tumor behind. And it even co correlates with poor overall survival. We also looked as we started doing more and more cases whether it was, there's an indication it's helpful and it seems to be the, the positive margin rate was lower in the cases we were using the dye and the NIRs near infrared guided surgery. So that's near infrared uh, camera that we're using. And so we just kept plugging away at the, the trial um, application. Uh, what was really important and again was to engage with patients. So I got uh, this worked really well for this trial. Um, Roger Wilson is a sarcoma survivor. And in fact, he set up Sarcoma UK, which is a big charity that funds obviously sarcoma research. So he's our PPI lead and uh, he has a CBE for services to healthcare in terms of setting up Sarcoma UK as a retired journalist. So, uh, so the PPI is very good from that point of view. Uh, and then Ben Hood is a, a nurse consultant who leads a patient group, a patient on perspectives on cancer group. And so we did lots and lots of work with uh, patients in order to des help design the trial. Uh, and we covered a whole lot of ground with them. So again, the collaboration is not limited to your design team uh, and your pathology lab and whatever. It really was important to have this extremely strong uh, to get an NIHR award. Um, and then obviously working with the statisticians, we worked out how we're going to power the trial and how many patients were randomized. And that was the flow chart. So this all together took um, from the first meeting in December 2019 uh, all the way to uh, March 2022 before it was uh, awarded. So uh, quite a process. The other thing was engaging with Stryker, one of the companies that makes the camera. Uh, and we're still negotiating some of the intellectual property. So that's another area I've got a bit of experience in now is realizing that you have to work with your business, business development office uh, in the, on the trust side, which interfaces with the clinical trials unit that's in the university. And then you're having meetings with a, a lawyer from the company who's based in Toronto and you're having some negotiations, which... Uh, are important to understand and, and understanding intellectual property at an early stage of your academic career is actually really quite important, probably worthy of a session in itself. Um, back to the pathology, right? I already had good links with the pathology lab. So the obvious thing to do was to, to work more on that and, and also do some work in the lab to look at mechanisms of uptake of the dye. And then I've been working with a radio chemist and I'll show you some of that as well. But basically, you know, if we take some of the tumor tissue versus muscle that's not fluorescing, we could then put it in paraffin blocks and then make slides out of it. And then this, this again was a good year's work, but basically um, we managed to, again, collaborating with a Olympus who make a really neat slide scanner 
and one of their technicians, we actually sent him the slides in London uh, because it was quite difficult to pick up this dye on a normal fluorescence microscope because it's, um, it's in the far red zone, as we call it. But then taking a representative case and because I work with a pathologist, I know what block I want and I can ask them, can we have this specific close margin block where it's fluorescing a lot from the operating theater. And then we get these sort of images where we've got tumor versus uh, marginal tissue and we can zoom right in uh, and look at the spatial orientation of the dye at a cellular level. So this is really getting quite exciting and has actually led to a collaboration with Harvard uh, a team there. Um, and so this this whole trial has uh, a professor of histopathology involved uh, and actually um, collaborating with a colore colorectal surgeon in Dublin who is a director of the Department of Precision Surgery there. So he's going to do fluorescence mapping work on the images from the operating room from the trial. And then we're going to map that back to the pathology. Uh, and funnily enough, our marker MT1 MMP is really useful for looking at the margin of, of, of the tissue from these patients. Uh, why not push it a bit further? And we again uh, I mentioned collaborating with a, a radio chemist who was headhunted from Oxford a few years ago, and he did a little seminar. And I had time to get to the seminar, and it was really good that, that I did because he presented that he wanted to develop radio traces for oncology and uh, based on uh, labeling monoclonal antibodies. And of course, I had a great monoclonal antibody that had already been working uh, and it was against MT1MP. So we had a whole workflow ready to go. Uh, and he was able, again, funded by Orthopedic Research UK to deliver on this project uh, where essentially he was labeling a monoclonal antibody to MT1MP. We were injecting it in the tail vein of the mouse using the same mouse model that I showed you for the therapeutics and we're able to make the tumors for us right so that's so this makes it more specific to our sarcomas and we're looking at ways of getting this into the clinic and now I'm ending up meeting with a pharmacy production team in the trust to talk about how we collaborate and get costings to get the next level of funding so um so James Knight's our radio chemist that we collaborate with that's Tony the, uh, his PhD student Patients, Corey Chan, who did a lot of the, the, the work on the cellular mechanisms, Helen Blair's a senior postdoc who um, supervises the mouse modeling uh, work, Samir Luli is a postdoc who actually supervises the imaging of the mice, Marcus did the data work. So you can see suddenly how many people get involved, right? So my colleagues in the sarcoma service are very helpful to me and protective of my time so I can keep doing the research. Colleagues around the country are co applicants on the uh, on the trial. That's the Sir Bobby Robson Cancer Trials team. Um, uh, so all of these people are involved. I just list them, obviously, I'm not going to read them out, but this is how many people start to get involved when you want to deliver some sort of research that hopefully is going to be practice changing. Um, so again, on the trust side, you're working with business development managers, the finance office, you're working with a pharmacist to check on the die. So that's about it for me, really. I mean, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but this is what happened to me. And I think it really was basically that I am really interested in all sorts of things. And I found it really interesting to collaborate widely. Um, I don't think any two ideas too crazy. I mean, the Naked Mole Rat one, I did think was too crazy, but it got funded, right? Um, and it was just really interesting all the way along. You'll just learn a lot. You'll discover a lot. You make new friends and... Um, Overall, I think collaborative research, there's really no limit to it. And um, there's not many downsides really. Um, I haven't been, I wouldn't say I've been distracted badly by applications that have taken up a lot of time and not gone anywhere. Most of the, the, the interactions have worked really well and we've ended up pulling off some interesting things as I, I hope you can appreciate. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rangan, for that wonderful talk. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Mason, for the talk. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. There is one question. Um, I don't know if uh, Prof. Mason is on the call. I think she might be driving. Um, 
Mr. Rankin, are you available at all? I, I'm here as well. Oh, sorry. Um, I, so it's a question for both of you. Um, so it's a question from Matt Partridge. As a medical student, what are the best ways to get started on the pathway of a research clinician? So I guess both of you, um, any advice? It's probably better for me not to. I, I'm not a clinician, so maybe that's better answered by by uh, my colleague. Uh, yeah, I think I showed in my, my talk a couple of examples of intercalating students who have then um, continued on from that point. So if you're basically, if you're still able uh, during your medical school training to intercalate and do whatever research, but in Newcastle, the, the obvious example is... Um, the masters of research which works really well because it's intercalate for a year and it's a six month taught component and then a six month project and i think that works really well i've supervised quite a few students and um a couple of them i, I think i mentioned marcus was involved in the trial and also corey's done lab work and they've gone they've continued on so they became AFPs or it's called SFP now is it? and then uh, now they've both got NIHR ACF posts and are heading towards a PhD so I think as a medical student if you can intercalate essentially and do a research degree that's that's the key because it gives you that time to do some research work out whether you want to do any research at all you might not like it at all or and then but if you like it then whether what you want to be in the lab or doing some data projects or, or whatever. Perfect, thank you. Um, and just to add to that, we do have a talk on um, how to become a clinic, um, how to get into academics as a clinician. Um, that's on. That's the last talk of our series. Um, I think there's another question from um, Abdal Rahman. Um, you can either type it in the chat or or speak um, from your mic if you want. I will just speak because um, um, it's about, um, um, basically if I'm a medical student and I'm about to graduate, but I haven't got the chance to, um, to get an SFP uh, allocation. So I got a normal FY1 job. Uh, am I still, does that hinder my chances of, of, of getting into research? Um, so I would, I would say, no, if you really want to do it and you're persistent, you can, you can do research at any time, obviously, uh, you can join the academic pathways at any point. I happened to join it quite late as a, because the path, pathways weren't quite as well formed as they are now. So I joined it, uh, as an ACL. Um, so it doesn't, I wouldn't say definitely, well, I suppose it hinders it slightly if you haven't gone up. You know the route the you know as a medical student and then uh, sfp as you say but um if you're really keen you can overcome it definitely and uh, becoming an acl was really the big difference for me i don't think i would have kept going in academia if i didn't get that opportunity to get that it's about time it's getting that extra time protected time to do projects um or, or at least be involved in projects uh so yeah, so if you're still interested in it, just look up look up potential supervisors, uh, and you can you know it doesn't stop you applying to the ACF. Um, and at any point, if you want to do a, uh, to come out of program and do a PhD classically, then if you get funding, you can come out and do it. But I think going up the academic pathway, obviously, you, you probably get a better CV, but it's not impossible. And if like many things, if you're persistent, you can do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I, there are numerous examples um, that are people that I know that that have just done ACFs without doing SFPs. Um, someone I work with uh, took time out, like Mr. Rankin mentioned, to do a PhD on a normal SD program. So yeah, that, I'm sure there are there are many ways to get into uh, research. Um, oh, could you just could you just clarify what is the ACF pathway quickly? Um, Mr. Rankin, I think you'd be better suited to this question than I am. The ACF, yeah. Well, I mean, basically, that's um, NIHR funding to appoint 
um, trainees, obviously with an academic interest, and they usually start as ST1 and go and run right through. So um, the thing to do in your region is just to work out so um, which, yeah, wh whenever the interviews are in your area, basically. Um, and then they've become quite competitive at times. So the orthopedic, so the, you know, it's not like just an orthopedic slot, as it were, there's, you're often competing in the interviews with other specialties. So this year, for example, here this year, I was interviewing as orthopedics versus rheumatology. Um, yeah, it was just rheumatology in the end. I think there was supposed to be intensive care medicine, but there wasn't a, a candidate. But there's often three specialties you're competing against. Uh, but then once you, if you're successful, that gives you your run through from ST1, and then you get blocks of four months and then you would be looking to get PhD. You still have to get your PhD funding. It doesn't come with PhD funding. It just makes it uh, more likely you can get that because you've, uh, you're getting these blocks of time to work on building uh, a project that you will apply then to take forward uh, as a PhD. Does that mean I have to start at ST1 or is it okay straight, straight away after med school from FY1? Oh, for the ACF. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can apply. So Corey, who did an MRS with me, and then uh, he was gunning for it really early on, and he got it early on. So he still had to finish his F1 and 2, but then uh, he then slotted into... Uh, yeah, so it's a bit, it's slightly interchangeable. He's, he's a core trainee at the moment, but it's kind of called ST1 and 2, and then he's, but then he runs through an orthopedics from ST3 on, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions at all before we end? Um, on that note, thank you again um, to Mr. Rankin and Prof. Mason for your time today. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, and everyone else, we our next talk is on audit and um, QIPs. Um, that is on the 24th of May, if I'm not mistaken. Um, same time on a Wednesday. Um, and we'll be sending other invites as usual. So thank you everyone for your time again, and thank you once again, Mr. Rankin and Prof. Mason.